Hello, I am John Martin. This video is about the DNA sequencing of a stealth adapted virus that was cultured from a patient with a chronic fatigue syndrome. I hope you'll enjoy the science. The research project began in 1986 and in an earlier video I described the research leading to the isolation or the culturing of a virus from a patient. The project began utilizing the polymerase chain reaction to look specifically for human herpes virus 6, not finding that as a reliable marker in chronic fatigue syndrome patients, I then modified the PCR assay, making it more broadly reactive. In the one assay, we could get a positive response with all of the then known human herpes viruses. These are herpes simplex virus, virus zoster, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, and human herpes virus 6. Using that modified assay, we did find many chronic fatigue patients giving a positive result, whereas the controls were negative. Validation of that approach came from testing patients with more severe neurological diseases. I mentioned a six-month-old child who we had the cerebrospinal fluid coming from around the brain and we could show that was giving us a positive PCR assay even though there was no cellular response. This led to the idea of a virus somehow being there but not triggering the immune response, a stealth type virus. This was validated further when we had the opportunity in the early 1990 to look at a brain biopsy from a patient who was admitted to the University of Southern California. Her initial illness was similar to the onset of many patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, but it deteriorated and there were abnormal areas identified by magnetic resonance imaging in the brain and this allowed the surgeons to take a small piece of tissue and so, uh, provide it for pathological diagnosis. I looked at that tissue. The most striking feature was the lack of any inflammation in the tissue, yet it was giving a positive PCR assay. On electron microscopy, I could see cells, the glial cell, abnormal with a lot of vacuoles. These areas are filled with lipid. These probably had lipid earlier before the fixation and it gives a foamy vacuolated appearance. One of the suggestions then was the possibility of a spuma virus. Spuma is a Latin word for foam and this is a type of retrovirus which has additional genes in what are known as the bell region between the envelope gene and a long terminal repeat. So I therefore included primers that were based on a similarly located tax genes of human T lymphotropic viruses 1 and 2. That was very fortuitous because we then found that they too were giving us a reliable positive polymerase chain reaction in chronic fatigue patients. I had the opportunity to meet up with such a positive PCR patient who was actually working for an infectious disease clinician here in Los Angeles. She very kindly offered to provide her blood so that we could work pretty hard to see what was the virus causing this positive PCR. After several weeks of culturing, using different conditions, the virus arose. And I showed a photograph of that earlier. This, therefore, allowed us to have a positive culture to proceed with the characterization of the virus, the molecular characterization. What is the virus? What type of virus? Where does it come from? I then published an article on this topic in August of 1994. It's available online and please take time to read the text. What I'd like to do 
is focused basically on the data and show the sequence of studies. First, figure one is a photograph of the uh, cultures. These are normal cells that are stained, so you can see the elongated nuclei and the thin cells tightly packed together. Early, after adding blood samples from the patient, foci develop where some of these cells round up, become brighter under phase contrast, and begin to show cell damaging effect. What was striking was the tendency of the damaged cells to fuse together so that there are now seven nuclei, rounded more than the original nuclei, and in a single cell now where the cytoplasm, this area, is foamy, evacuated. Now this appearance is not typical of what one normally sees in a viral culture laboratory. It had features that were really quite different and couldn't be clearly identified. I went ahead and examined a positive culture, or several of them, by electron microscopy. What we then noted, this is an electron micrograph, this is a large nuclei, there's a cytoplasm, the cytoplasm has these vacuoles, and many of the vacuoles are filled with these viral-like particles. There are also viral particles inside the nuclei. Again, this is not typical of the electron micrograph that one would see with uh, conventional human viruses. It has features of a herpes virus, but it also is still consistent with a spuma type virus. That's the benefit of having a molecular technology because with a positive culture, knowing that we could get a positive polymerase chain reaction, we could get a segment of the nucleic acid from the virus and begin sequencing data. But to go through the steps we did, we ran the polymerase chain reaction with the same primers that gave a positive result on the blood of the patient. When we run the polymerase chain reaction, we apply the products to an agarose gel, which is here. That's subjected to electrophoresis, an electric current, so the DNA moves through the gel. How far down it goes is a direct measure of how small the DNA uh, piece is. So that with that in mind, control our known DNA or known size markers so one can assess the size of any PCR product. This was the positive culture of a human T lymphotropic virus and it gave the expected product, I think, 158 nucleotides. This was striking. This was a large product estimated to be around 1,500 nucleotides. In fact, it turns out there are two products around that size in this band. So we had a portion of the virus amplified. What we could then do is simply cut this DNA out. And I should mention, the reason you can see the DNA because we can stain with this ethidium bromide staining that makes it easily apparent, um, the band. So we can cut this out. Then I can take that DNA, separate it into single strands, radio label it so that we can then use it as a probe to look for that same sequence. Obviously, we want to see if that sequence is unique to the positive culture. So we take DNA and RNA and do electrophoresis on material isolated from normal cultures, uninfected or infected cultures, or we can take the fluid from the infected culture, filter it, you get rid of the cell debris, and then ultra centrifuge it, spin it at a very high speed so that even the virus would be pelleted to the bottom. Take that material, put that also on the gel, and run that by electrophoresis. Not as clearly shown here as on the original, but there was a very definite band at this level. 
This was intriguing again. The size of this appeared to be about 20,000 nucleotides, much less than had it been a conventional herpes virus. They migrate higher up in the gel around this area because their size is close to, or a little bit beyond even, 200,000 nucleotides, depending upon what type of herpes virus. So we had a virus. The next question was, will the probe, the PCR product, when radio-labeled, react with the DNA of the infected culture, which it clearly did, but it also reacted with the DNA in this band, you can see here, with no real resulting, no real binding to the normal uh, DNA from the normal culture. So the next question, having got this band, what is it? DNA, RNA? So we did a similar type analysis where we had size markers to determine the size. The DNA um, band is clearly shown here. And then we had similar material, but we digested it with enzymes that will specifically cut double-stranded DNA. And here is the fragments that occurred from reacting this type of product with these enzymes. So this clearly established that what we had was double-stranded DNA. This is cutting the um, normal DNA from the whole cell with the same enzymes where you get a smear of products. But this indication was that we had double-stranded DNA. The other thing we can do with the labeled DNA from the PCR product is show that the material, again, is in the DNA of the infected cells. If we cut them with enzymes, we will get very defined markers. What this begins to show here, the two products, one was in a plasma 15.5.2, another in the plasma 15.5.4. Just while we're here to show that with that labeled PCR product, we could then go back to all the different cultures that we had repeatedly obtained from that patient and show that they all contain the DNA the controls 9 and 10 in this line, and all 10 giving no response. So we knew we were repeatedly isolating this virus from this patient. We also, then having got um, the primer, could go back to the patient and do a blood sample, which was positive, as was the culture. So no question, the patient was persistently infected. The real bottom line of the study, though, is to go back and see what the um, virus, what comprises the virus. I mentioned that there were two products around this 1,500 or 1 1.5 kilobase pairs that were generated by the PCR. One of the products, cologne into plasmid 1552, contained 1,484 bases. The other, uh, cloned into 1554 plasmid, contains slightly more, 1,539 bases. Then the issue was having sequenced it, submit the sequence to GenBank. <coughs> the results came back. One, there was no matching of any public sequences with what we had sequenced from plasmid 1552. Just didn't recognize it. The 1554 sequence, however, was recognized, and the recognition that was uh, closely, the, the best recognition came back with human cytomegalovirus. What this uh, figure, table one, shows is in the first line of each set of two lines is the sequence from the PCR product. As you'd expect, underlined here is the primer that allowed for the amplification, and at the other end, the primer back at this level. What again was interesting, it was the same primer, so we didn't even require two different primers, 
just a single primer was able to bind at both ends of this pretty large segment. The next one that the computer comes back with is the identity when compared to human cytomegalovirus. Where these vertical lines are showing is where the nucleotide is identical between the stealth virus and the cytomegalovirus. These letters here refer to the nucleotide bases, the adenosine, thymidine, cytosine, guanosine, ATCG. This is about a 58% similarity. We were able, since we could clone the virus then and find additional extended sequences, even extend that sequence further, and then the matching was about 50%. Significant enough to say that it was cytomegalovirus related, but not clearly identical to known human, human cytomegalovirus. It could be a variant of human cytomegalovirus or a cytomegalovirus that had undergone very extensive mutations, but there was another answer available, and that came from the next article. This is this article, the African green monkey origin of this stealth virus. Again, to go through the data, what we were able to do is clone additional regions of that virus. Because we had the, um, uh, identified that 20 kilobase product, we could cut that, as I said, with enzymes, insert it into plasmids, grow the plasmids, isolate the inserts, sequence the inserts, and then we would look at that sequence. There was very little sequence available at the time about cytomegaloviruses of monkeys or even any animal. But occasionally we would find a sequence where we could see the matching with human cytomegalovirus, but at the same time see a far better matching or at least the computer would show it to us, with African green monkey simian cytomegalovirus. To show you that, move through. This is a type of presentation. The sequence in the middle line is that of the stealth-adapted virus. The top line is the sequence of the this region of the African green monkey simian cytomegalovirus, and this line is the sequence of human cytomegalovirus. Again, it's pretty clear there's better matching with the African green monkey than with the human. Also on this line, you see again, relatively little matching with the human cytomegalovirus, good matching with the African green monkey. With that, we could also find sequences where there was also sequences of the rhesus monkey cytomegalovirus. So the monkey, again, the stealth virus is shown here, the simian cytomegalovirus from African green monkey, and then this, um, the rhesus cytomegalovirus, which again, doesn't match particularly well. So we knew the virus was much closely, more, more closely matched to African green monkey simian cytomegalovirus than either human cytomegalovirus or rhesus monkey cytomegalovirus. We could um, extend that uh, analysis finding additional clones to make it an unequivocal statement. This is again another piece of uh, sequence data from the stealth virus matching to African green monkey simian cytomegalovirus far better than the human cytomegalovirus. Also, we could, or well, the computer can translate the sequence into amino acids, and a stretch of nucleotides would give rise to this amino acid um, sequence, which matched except for one amino acid to African green monkey simian cytomegalovirus far better than the same proteins or amino acid sequence in human cytomegalovirus 
mouse cytomegalovirus, human herpes virus 6, Epstein-Barr, etc. The significance of this finding is that kidney cells from African green monkeys are routinely used to produce live polio vaccines. Moreover, it's known that many African green monkeys are infected with simian cytomegalovirus. As I noted in the article, the potential introduction of pathogenic viral variants into human through the use of African green monkeys should be evaluated. I provided the result and sent a letter to Wyeth, the producer of live polio vaccines, visited the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, in Bethesda, Maryland, and even had the opportunity to make a small statement at an ongoing conference. And I was invited more or less through the back door to a conference being held by the Institute, Institute of Medicine on Vaccine Safety in November of 1995. To say the results were whitewashed would be an understatement. Yet, fortunately, the research continued, and as I will describe in the next one or two videos, the fascination now is that in that stealth adaptation process, not only does the virus lose the components that would be normally targeted by the immune system, but they also can acquire new genetic sequences, some from the infected cells and some from other microbes. And this is opening up a whole new understanding of what comprises viruses. I hope you will follow the work. Thank you very much.